<laughs> this is said for a reason, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who are, we, who are we starting with? Do you want to talk about the costuming? Because a lot of there's a really elaborate set of wardrobe on the show that is very eye catching. Yeah. For me, I mean, and for Ian in the first season, I was lucky enough to wear the Kingsguard outfit, which, when you see it up close, honestly, it is stunning. All, sorry, all the costumes are stunning. The attention to detail, so much of the detail you, you don't even see, but it is so perfect. Now, it was heavy. By season five, it kept getting heavier every season because they kept making it more ornate and more elaborate. So by the fifth season, it was 28 kilos. You could which yeah, it's, yeah, about, it's about four and a half stone and uh, I had to stand on the back of a boat coming into Bravos Harbour in 28 kilos of armour which I think was probably the most terrifying moment of my, of my life but there's something about the costumes you put them on and suddenly you're the yeah, king's guard yeah, they it think, helps your yeah, performance they do, they do. so much yeah. and they are so vital I yeah. think you're, you're to right. the look of the show and, and yeah. the success of the show. You yeah. can't underestimate the value of costume. It, it mm. gives you a real sense of character. Mm. Mm. But uh, that that uh, armor, the upper part of it is actually fiberglass. No, it was only fiberglass when you wore a chum. Well, it they was changed the brass in season two. All right, yeah. you got unlucky. Yeah. It was fiberglass, and I have to say, it the upper part was amazingly comfortable. It really was. It was lovely to wear, and uh, it looked great. I was comfortable. The skirt, by contrast, which went down as mid-calf, was thousands, and it must have been thousands, of little leaves of brass. It weighed a ton. It pulled you down so that by the end of the day, I mean, your feet were tired because everything was sort of like being pulled down towards the ground. So, uh, I mean, it's a shame because the best-looking part of it was actually the best bit to wear. The other bit was hard work. Yeah. Yeah. And wait, bathroom wait. breaks were a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> And the brass, Go do yourself yeah, the, an injury. The, the, the brass yeah. leaves yeah. actually did curl up under the lights, so when you yeah. sat down, it was literally a pain in the ass. <laughs> it, it tends to be the first, the first meeting you ever have when when you go into a series like that is with costume. Yeah, yeah. you do. Yeah, you get and, you, and I've never seen anything like it. And you kind of knew from that whatever you thought you were going into in Game of Thrones, and none of us did to begin with. I don't think. But that when you saw those costumes and were fitted for them, you kind of went, oh, I see. Mm. Oh, it's going to be that good. Oh, you're spending that much money. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the, thing, the thing that actually gave me that impression exactly was when I put on my Faith, my faith Millicent arm, uh, my Faith Millicent tunic for the first time, and they put the chains across my chest and crossed them. And I went, and, and they brought them out, and I realised the uh, the costume department was holding them both in two hands, because they all were proper bits of iron. They were solid iron. And you put them, put them on my shoulders and just... <clears throat> And over the course of the day, once you take it off, you have just you've got these you've just got marks on your body because they really imprint you, and that weight specifically when you wear it makes you go right. You're gonna just plug plug yourselves in, guys, because it really takes it makes it you very seriously. I remember uh, Roger Ashton Griffiths, who was Mace Tyrell, uh, was talking to the costume department about his character, and he had the, this idea that in High Garden which was the Tyrell seat, that he had a private zoo. Okay. Yeah. He just had this, this is private, private zoo. Roger. <laughs> and within a week, the costume department had his outfit embossed with elephant clasps. Yeah, it it was right. just, a, a, and it, and you look at, oh my God. And they were stunning. They were perfect. It's the one thing you tried to pinch from the show. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, tried, I tried to pinch my chains. <laughs> the other one thing, of course, about, about uh, the series is that there was, it wasn't a specific place. It wasn't a specific period. So in that sense, costume had free range, as did sets for that matter. You could go to whatever source for whatever location you wanted to do. So, you know, whether it was Mexico or whether it was China or whether it was Middle European or whatever... Each and every kind of court could have its own sort of very specific design that was unique to it, but it wasn't bound by time and place, and that was wonderful freedom for the designers, you know, and they took full advantage of it. So that's costume. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question. 
Uh, you know, with box sets and streaming services, the way people watch television has changed. Do you have to make different programs to cater for that? You know, because people sit and watch six in a row, so well, it's getting cliffhangers and things like that. It's funny, I, it's something that has come up more and more in the general media conversation. The way our industry has changed with the streaming services, the different platforms. But for all that, I believe, I believe at the moment that we are entering what I regard to be the golden age of television. I believe going to the cinema 10 or 15 years from now will be as specialised as going to the theatre today. Because I believe more and more it will come into your home. The latest movies will come into your home. The television sets are getting bigger mm. and they're getting cheaper. The sound systems, you have everything that you require. For me, Game of Thrones has set a benchmark. And it has set a benchmark in quality. It's no surprise to me to find out that the new series are being uh, commissioned looking for the next Game of Thrones. I believe Game of Thrones has set a benchmark and I believe it's very, very high. It's the production values, it's the scripts, the storylines, the acting, the attention to detail. Each episode is a movie in itself and it's movie quality. I defy anybody to tell me they've seen anything better on television than season six, episode nine, The Battle of the Bastards. It was the best thing I've ever seen. It was the best episode of television I have ever seen. And 20 years from now, people will be streaming Game of Thrones or watching Game of Thrones on whatever uh, service they will get it on. And it will have the same impact 20 years from now as it has today. I'm absolutely certain of that. Yeah, I think the, 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 I mean, the, so benchmark, the benchmark in terms of quality is very high, but they kind of create a problem, not just for themselves, but for anybody who follows hereafter. When you do this box set thing, it's almost like each each and every episode has to be, whew, you know, a surprise moment uh, or, or a, a total mm. shock. Mm. And Game of Thrones has pushed themselves on that front and done it very well. I mean, so many episodes now, it's like, what's going to happen this time? Where is this going to end? But there's a, real, there's a real pressure now on each and every th show to somehow or another find a big out, a big, a big challenge with each mm -hmm. episode so yeah. you go away. Sort of. And that, that, that's, that's tough. I mean, at some point, you know, people are going to probably say we've got to start shying away from this. But for the moment, that's the way it's going. Weirdly, though, I think less so, you, you were talking about cliffhangers, and I think, you know, that was always the case with network shows, certainly in America, where you, almost every ad break happens has to have a cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. And I think with things like Game of Thrones, and, and well, because of companies like HBO and all the other companies that are <coughs> doing similar work, it's less of that now. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, each episode, mm -hmm. you know, makes you want to watch the next, but it's not quite so obviously cheaply, like, if we're going to get them back after the commercial break, we're mm -hmm. going to have to... And you, and you still watch network shows now, and you go, it's unbelievable how many yeah. cliffhangers in one hour that they yeah, to. Yeah, you have to write yeah. into it. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the, the thing about the nature of what TV is doing at the moment is that the, pop, the public's <coughs> appetite, they're just, their actual ability to consume the stuff they're given in whatever show they're watching has just increase tenfold, you know, because now that you've got the ability to be able to essentially stream any ten episodes back to back, I mean, if you really were committed, you could watch ten hours in a day, you could just if bomb your way through it and you're done, done. you probably would regret it because you don't savour it that much, but you could do it, so what it means is that what has become, in Game of Thrones case, six months worth of filming and footage is consumed in, 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 in potentially a day or two, and it's, um, in that sense, you can just eat so much television, it's just extraordinary. Um, so it is a golden age of television without any doubt, but it's also, um, you know, it, it has to have a lot, of, a lot of energy to maintain itself. And um, there are so many shows out nowadays, and I'm addicted to a lot of them. I love House of Cards. I, I mean, I remember when it came out, I didn't realise until, until the, the, the most recent season came out just quite how much I liked it, because it was gone in two days. You know, I had work to do, but I didn't. I just watched it, you know. So it's um, it's having an effect really on, on, on people, which is um, I think rather rather interesting. Speaking personally as a parent, I have to say I I am so delighted that you can watch two or three episodes of one thing at the same time because all I get is Adventure Time, SpongeBob, and when I eventually get the kids to bed. That is when I get a chance to actually watch what I want to watch, or when I've got them to school in the morning. Um, I do 
I do love the idea that there will be so much available to the viewer and it can be consumed in three hour chunks or two hour chunks or four hour chunks. I do think it will increase the quality. I really strongly believe that. And I believe Game of Thrones, I mean, there's a reason why Game of Thrones has won more Emmys than any other show in history. It's that good. It really is that good. And just when you think they can't get any better than that, it gets better. And I think that will set a standard for the television shows to come. And that can only be good for the viewer. Yeah. That means quality television is on its way. Because if it's not good enough quality, it will not be watched. Mm. Yeah. But they, they've been amazing about maintaining the level. Yeah. It's so difficult for series to kind of like, you know, you can set it up. Are you going to keep it up there? The irony is they have. They, they, they've managed to do that time and time again. I think, it's, I think it's quite well known within the industry that you can have a great season one, but season two is the make or break. If it's not good in season two, it will sink. And, you know, I think we've seen that. We've seen shows that have not made it to season three, certainly not made it to season four. And it is a quality issue because the viewer is the ultimate arbiter of whether a show is successful or not. I think that's a good thing. I, I, I tell you what's very important, and certainly it's been very true of Game of Thrones, <clears throat> is the role of the showrunner, which is a big thing from the American side. I don't think we do it in the same way, and I think we should think about it more this side, uh, you know, of, of just how to, how to make sure that you maintain that quality. And uh, certainly Dan and David in, in Game of Thrones, I mean, they've been very, very efficient showrunners, you know, in terms, and they, they are across everything, everything. And yeah. I think, you know, with any series that succeeds, that key writer stroke showrunner is absolutely imperative because lots of different directors come in. There's probably a variety of editors. There's all sorts of different people working across it. So there has to be some one common focal point, some person or people who absolutely know what it is they're looking for in this and keep the pedal to the floor. And uh, so the showrunner is very, very important. And we don't really do it in British TV, to my knowledge. And I think yeah, it's something we should probably I'm, look at more. I was saying, I, I'm working on, the, 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 they're making a series of the Guy Ritchie movie, Snatch, which I'm filming at the moment. And we have a showrunner. Do you? Yeah. And it's, it, it does make a huge difference. Yeah. Mm, because yeah. He's, he totally knows the arc of it. Yeah. He's not writing the whole thing, although he's writing a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And he is constantly there on set. He is absolutely in charge of his vision. Yeah, so it's good if that's come from America. I mean, yeah. it is a Sony, a Sony Crackle production. So I suppose it is an American production, but it's been made here. Yeah, yeah. A, a final note: It's interesting to see the crossover now with so many established film stars <coughs> doing television. Yeah, I think mm. that is a huge mm. indicator of the way our industry is going, and I think it will continue to do so. And the best directors. And the yeah, best directors. Yeah, yeah, here. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh, at which point we have to mention Miguel Sapochnik. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, look at you. Look at you for getting a chance to work with him. I had David Nutter. Yeah, that was all right. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. talking about our most recent chunk of Thrones, I and mean, obviously, Eugene, for you, um, <coughs> you were involved in some dramatic and, in some cases, climactic moments on the last season. Can you talk a little bit for you about being involved, particularly in some of those crucial bits? Well, the, uh, the the final episode really was something that I think no one really knew. The the, the, the on, on paper it was so explosive, literally, that you could <coughs> imagine how there were a million ways anyone could do it. But there are also nine hundred ninety-nine thousand of them could have been ballsed up. And the one that we ended up with was thanks to pre-mentioned Miguel Sapochnik for creating for first of all preempting uh, the uh, see episode ten with the Battle of the Bastards, which was probably I mean I mean re in all ob objectivity and humanity, it's probably one of the most stunning battles I've ever seen. And um, I, I like Lord of the Rings, I like the third Lord of the Rings film, but that was still uh, just unbelievably brilliant because so little of it was was actually CGI'd. In other words, they, the, the the impact of like cavalry charging into one another was actually done to a certain degree. And then all they did was take the isolated incident of the small number of cavalry that they had and simply multiply it. So really, it wasn't as though they just went right. We've got a field, and we're just going to bring everything in through CGI. They actually did it. Um, 
which is another credit that has to be given to TV at the moment. It's yeah. not really trying to base so much of itself in, in, in realistic action as much as it can yeah. until a dragon comes marching in. Um, but That's I mean, proper uh, filmmaking. Well, yeah, no, it is. It's proper filmmaking. I mean, you know, as far as, I mean, way back when, things like, you know, like, like, like Bonaparte, I mean, they really hired the whole Russian army to come in and just to, to, on horseback and basically mm. used hundreds, thousands of men. But, um, but I think that the, the last episode for me, uh, as far as sort of bits of television go, when I was filming um, the scene beneath the crypt when Lancel is trying to put out the wildfire, one of the things that I couldn't properly, I couldn't properly really foresee about how just how amazing it would be was because I didn't know what music they were going to use. And when you listen to the orchestra in the, that particular winding up towards the wildfire exploding, the music just creeps into your skin and it totally bl blankets you in suspense, curiosity and terror actually I think is the most important one and I thought that it made the episode so much more powerful going from everyone from Marjorie Tyrell knowing Cersei is up to something to the High Sparrow for the first time in the entire show wonderful Jonathan Price, the first time we've ever seen him have doubt and then even fear and the music led us into that, that exposure, I thought that it was just revealed in the most, uh, in the most brilliant way. Um, I have, and to, I say, love I have to say, I never understood the composure of the Game of Thrones music. Mm. I can never pronounce his name, God forgive me. He's, doing, uh, uh, he's, done, he's done Westworld he, as well. He's um, done Westworld as well. He's, if he's watching this, we apologise. And I we do apologise to you, but I do not understand why he wasn't nominated for an Emmy. <laughs> like yeah, simply, for that, yeah, for that, really, for that really episode alone, the, yeah, yeah, the, the, the music in that episode was in a state absolutely of stunning. You know what I mean? stunning. Yeah. But but the, the the scene in itself, just before that, the wildfire goes off and we lose. I mean, we lose both ourselves, die in it, and and. and at least eight other, seven to eight other Game of Thrones characters are, are all are, are vanquished straight away. The, the 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 scene itself, when I was dragging myself along the corridor, I mean, there was no CGI for that. There was a full-on underground catacomb in a Belfast <coughs> castle. All of the lights for the bits of wildfire, no 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 CGI. They were all just a chemical that shone in that way. When I got up to the candle and I was about to put out supposedly the wild the the, the candles, um, the the crew had put down some chemicals that were, would ignite when I got close enough to it. And the first thing, the first time I said this when we were downstairs, the first take when they set off the fire, I got up to it and was within about a foot of this puddle and someone clicked their fingers to suggest lighting the, light, light the fire off camera and the thing just right in front of my face and the look on my face when, 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 I, was, when I came back from not being in front of the fire was just... was just... <laughs> <laughs> and I was totally taken aback because that was the only that was the most real effect I'd ever seen. Um, I don't know how I can do it. Enough credit. I just thought that it was wonderfully Stunning. done, and um, and I think that what that has set that set a precedent for season seven being just a, such such a clean and rather terrifying slate. You know, really, it is. You know, everything, everyone is now marching on King's Landing. You know, Daenerys is coming for us and the White Walkers are coming down and nothing is probably going to be able to stop them. Everything is now, for the first time in Thrones, given it's such a complicated show, it's now going to meet the nuclear. It's it's there's yeah. going to be a nucleus the at the centre of the end of Thrones. The weird thing is, and that's the yeah. thing about it. And that's, that's, that was a long-term bit of screenwriting that they have always been building towards. Yeah. And it, again, just, just it, you couldn't, it could not be more fitting of the word epic. It's well, they've it's set enormous. themselves big challenges because we we all believe we've been in battles significant already. Yeah, the lost to come. Is yeah, no, it is. It is. I mean, well, what if the battle in the bastards end up looking like a kind of mild playground skirmish? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You know, a sort of well, sand, a sort of sand castle. Yeah, that yeah, is, yeah, exactly. That is certainly the suggestions that are that are coming out of yeah. said that there are things to come in season seven, and it's lovely because we are getting the strands coming back. Coming together, I think I saw a poster uh, for season seven, <coughs> and the tagline was "The end begins." Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that was yeah, very, very yeah, clever, very and it was extraordinary because a lot of people have been talking about how the uh, season seven has, uh, in fact, been split into two. So there will now be a season eight. There'll be seven episodes in season seven, and six episodes in season eight, and the reason for that was that when HBO asked David and Dan at the end of season six how much longer they needed, David and Dan said 
13 hours. They didn't say 12. They didn't say 14. They knew exactly what they need. And I think it's a testament to both of them that they have everything. Yeah, yeah. They know exactly what they want. Mm. Down to it's a tea. privilege to work for. I think obviously fans know what they want as well. They have their own feelings about how they want the show to ultimately end. I mean, for you guys having been a part of it, do you have? I mean, obviously you've got your investment in your different factions and that. But do you have a hope or a feeling for what you ideally want from that final ever episode when it does eventually grace our screens? I think it's. I think it's almost impossible not to romanticise it in terms of what ending you want. You know, there is some sort of vision everyone has in mind, and I mean, a lot of people have the have the idea of Daenerys Targaryen taking the Iron Throne and vanquishing all the White Walkers and long live the Queen. I find that a rather um, droll and um, sort of not a, partic not a particularly interesting ending. It's, 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 a little, too, it's, easy. it's too easy. It's yeah, too easy. Yeah. Um, George doesn't do easy. They yeah. don't do easy. So, yeah. you know, whatever it is, it won't be easy. It, I mean, was, it was very strange because whenever uh, I, my, the, the, the moment of Game of Thrones that has hit me the most was hold the door. No spoilers, but for those who have seen it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Hold the door. Broke my heart. And I it all ends. And I personally have no idea where it's going to go. Yeah. Mm, yeah. People ask us, and you know, the only thing you can really say is just try, try to be a contrarian to yourself. If you want something, and you think, that's probably going to happen, reverse it in, you its, can enti guarantee reverse it's, it in yeah. its entirety, and you're probably closer to the answer, really. I, don't, I, think I'd, I, I've, people say, I have no idea. None of us do. Yeah. We're all dead. I believe Daenerys is going to die. I think that the Iron Cryo Throne is going to be destroyed. I think that I just don't think anything is. I think I think everything is going to, to change. But because it's 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 too easy otherwise. Yeah. Isn't it? But who knows? No, no. It'll, it'll we won't be, be disappointed. Probably most likely. Though. What has life been like after Game of Thrones? Um, particularly now that you're no longer involved in the show. Oh, I'll take this one first. Game of Thrones has completely changed my life and has completely changed my career. And I will be forever grateful to David and Dan for doing that for me. I am getting into rooms now, I'm getting jobs now uh, that I wouldn't have had a chance of five years ago. It is completely up to my profile uh, and it's a calling card. If you walk into an audition room and the director and the producer are looking and say, five seasons of Game of Thrones, well he can act. Uh, is he right for the role? I don't know. But he can act because he was in five seasons of Game of Thrones. Uh, so it has been a phenomenal experience for me. It was awful to leave it. It broke my heart. I miss it terribly. I miss it dreadfully because when you're filming, you're a part of this incredible family. And it is. It's like an incredibly large, incredible, wonderful family. Everybody knows each other. Everybody does their job so incredibly well. From the person at the base of the pyramid to the person at the top of the pyramid. It's why the show is so good. It has transformed my life. And I'm grateful. Yeah, I would agree with that. Definitely, it, it, it's a calling card compared with uh, whatever else you might have done before, simply because it's universally known and universally appreciated. Um, so, you know, uh, other than that, uh, everything else is happen chance. You know, it, 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 as you say, it opens doors and the rest is up to you, you know. I agree. I mean, it just, it's, it's, it, yeah, those I, words sum it up. Yes, they do. I, mean, I remember being very, very sad last day's film, I was with Roger and we mm. both went, because it became an annual event, we used to go to Belfast. <laughs> yeah, that was the thing, that was the thing. <laughs> suddenly we didn't have to go to Belfast anymore. There, there was a sort of seasonal routine to it, yeah. wasn't there? You yeah. arrived, I remember arriving and the first thing I would do without fail was I would listen to, um, uh, I, would listen to uh, I Will Wait by Mumford and Sons. That was, that was the song I associated with arriving back into Belfast City Airport. Really? And, I would, and when, I, when, I, when I drove back there, I just finished a film called The Lodgers um, on Friday, and when I drove back through Belfast to get home from Donegal, <laughs> put on the song. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, as a native, as a native of Belfast, it's awfully refreshing to hear people say, "I can't wait to go to Belfast." <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't, you didn't used to hear that. Let me tell you. <laughs> it has been very good for Belfast. It, too, has, been yeah, it has, has given it uh, much more of a cachet than it ever would have had. Mm. It really has. It has but changed. It has changed Northern Ireland's economy. It has made Northern Ireland uh, a centre of filming filmmaking. Mm -hmm. It has given us a new tourist industry that I would have to say, and I can say this because I come from Belfast, that is not associated with a disaster of one sort or another. Uh, it has done absolute wonders for our province mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and the economy and all the crew and mm -hmm. plasters, electricians, hotels, restaurants, you name it, the trickle-down effect has been stunning and seismic. 
And another thing, though, about just, just sort of the life of an actor, the great thing about a series like Game of Thrones, especially if you know that you're going to be in it for a while, is that we're all freelancers. So at the end of the day, you finish your job, where's the next one? You know? Mm. The great thing about doing something like that is it's a banker. For a few years at least, you can say, if nothing else, I know I'm doing that next year. That takes the pressure off yeah, next year a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it does. Everything else then is a bonus because you know you've got that. Yeah. But whenever that is gone, well then you're back to back well, what's the pool. Back back in the pool. Yeah. But, so, but, but having said thing. that, having said that, the way our industry is now, the way the entertainment profession is now, Game of Thrones is a gift that keeps on giving. Here we are at a comic con, yeah, meeting yeah. the fans, you know, and we, we travel the world, we go to comic cons, and it's just wonderful. Yeah. We should, we just should, wonderful. We should, with the, as a fool, we should give a shout out, actually, comic cons are such fun to do. For anyone watching this, you really should come along to them. They're the wonderful. place where you can be yourself most in the world. They are, the people are, without fail, absolutely lovely. Uh, they're joyous, yeah. and, um, uh, I, you know, they're just, they're just a wonderful, wonderful bit of, pop, of modern popular culture, and I recommend them to everyone. Yeah, 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 brilliant. We've had a great time with you know uh, over the last few years with the Comic Cons. Really, uh, and again, we meet up. Yeah, yeah, and we yes, exactly. that's lovely as well. It's like an old pals reunion for us. I mean, yeah. what, what, which was even nicer is. Uh,